My name is Katie Levan. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Aqueduct Technologies. We also have Rachel Meltzer here from our marketing team, as well as Shane O'Brien. I just want to note briefly that today's call is being recorded. We want to keep it interactive, so if at any point you'd like to ask a question, please do so. Um, we have the chat or Q&A box is available, or if you'd like to speak with us live, we love that as well. Um, and you can do so by just uh, clicking the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen, and we can unmute you um, to ask those questions live. So please don't hesitate at any point throughout to ask questions or comments at any time. Um, and we're thrilled today. We have Rich Elkins from Cisco joining us to present. So um, Rich, I'll hand it off to you if you'd like to introduce yourself to the group. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for starting your day with us. My name is Rich Elkins. I'm a data center solutions architect here at Cisco. Been doing this for seven years, covering the Northeast. So I probably work with you or your peers uh, today. So thanks for joining us and looking forward to getting started. All right. So I am here to talk to you about simplified IT operations with Cisco Intersight. Uh, just like Catherine was saying, I'm super casual. Throw your questions in as they come. I'll do my best to kind of keep up with them um, and we'll just, we'll take them as they come. All right, so a lot of you probably recognize this, right? This is the world we live in today, right? Um, you know, 10 years ago, we had a primary data center, maybe a secondary data center or a colo. Today, the, 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 the nature of data center workloads are mass, massively distributed across the entire world, whether it's in the cloud, public data centers, private data centers, TOLOs, SaaS services. There's just a wide distribution of how we manage our services today and the best way to do it the most effectively, right? And, it, and it's really hard, right? And, and we're doing this in a time of mass change, right? So, you know, we're asking our IT folks to go manage all these distributed resources and if that was their only job, that would be difficult in itself. But at the same time, we've gone through this transition in IT over the last 10 years of business cost center to business enabler, right? IT is no longer seen as like the necessary evil as an organization, but seen as a as competitive advantage against peer institutions. Uh, and, and if you look at that stat here on, on the left, right, 43% of organizations want to make changes more frequently, right, weekly. Right, that's really, really difficult. And when we look at our infrastructure people, right, again, they're they're managing all these resources distributed, like distributed across the world, but at the same time, they're being asked to have much more agility in those resources. Right. So this IT guy right here has to kind of be a jack of all trades because he's got storage, he's got uh, compute, he's got hypervisor, he's got network. So that person has to be able to respond and and provide resources to their business with that level of agility that business expects. And again, that's that's really hard because when you look at the tools they use today, right, it's the same tools they've been using for 10 years, right? The, the tools that you have that you're asked to enable the business with are siloed and manual. And again, they're the same tools that you have probably been using since the early 2000s or late 2010s, right? So the idea is we're being asked to do more in IT and we're not given the tools to go do that. So enter Cisco Intersight. Intersight is a data center platform designed to provide a single pane of glass to wherever you are to manage your equipment wherever your equipment is, right? So that distributed model no longer is a problem, it's an asset with something like Cisco Intersight. And Cisco Intersight is a platform, it's not a one size fits all, it's made of, of a few different pillars. I'm gonna focus on three of them today, but just know that there's more services as well. So the first thing I kind of want to talk about is our infrastructure service, right? So customers that are, are familiar, if you're familiar with Cisco UCS, you're probably familiar with our infrastructure service through UCS Manager, right? UCSM has been around forever, very powerful tool in terms of configuration enforcement, configuration management, uh, configuration automation, right? And we're bringing that forward into Intersight. So now I can do that same level of configuration automation through templates and service profiles that you've done in the past. Right? And I can do that globally because today, if you're using UCS, you're aware that I can do that same thing, but it's siloed into different domains. So I do work in one area and then I go do work in the same, in a different area, but it's the same work. Right? With Intersight, those silos are gone. So now I can have a common set of policies that are managing my entire fleet of infrastructure worldwide. 
right? And that's not just for your UCS servers. That could be for your VMs, EC2 instances, reserve instances, the ability for us to automate the configuration of your assets, regardless if they're in the cloud or on premise, is a central tenet of, of Intersight. And not only are we bringing forward common features and, and popular features that, are, that our customers have used over the last 10, 15 years of using UCS, but we're enhancing it, right? We're building the guardrails so our customer doesn't have to read release notes or understand through a vulnerability to know that there's a problem in their environment. So we've got proactive hardware compatibility checks to let you know if your drivers are a problem. And then we've got recommendation engines and vulnerability notifications to let you know if there's other problems in the environment that you need to take, uh, to take, um, take action on. And I'll demo all of this as well. The infrastructure service will manage our new Cisco X-Series blades. Uh, these have been out for a year and a half, probably a little longer, and we're actually just starting to ship our second generation of these servers. But Intersight can also manage your legacy servers too. So M4s, M5s, I even have M3s in the lab. So even though Intersight can modernize how you manage your data center, we don't have to leave your old equipment behind. In fact, we can come meet you where you are in your data center journey. And I'll, I'll demo all that as well. On top of our infrastructure service, we also have a, a cloud orchestrator, and this is our automation orchestration engine within Intersight. And not only can I automate your Cisco servers, but I can automate pure storage, Hitachi storage, NetApp, your networking equipment, uh, your fiber channel switching, your VMware environment. We can provide full self-service within Intersight if that's something you're looking for. Right? You can see this is in all of them. I'll take you through it as well in the demo. Um, but there's many tasks outside of Cisco UCS because the point of Intersight is to be a data center platform again. Right, So the idea is we want to manage the data center through a single pane of glass holistically. Right, So that one person can go make changes with, with great agility like we were talking about in the beginning. And a lot of my customers are already automating. Right, and that's totally fine, right? We can bring that automation forward. We can combine it with our cloud orchestration and actually invoke existing uh, PowerShell, Ansible, Terraform configuration or scripts. Um, but we could also, right, it's very easy to use Intersight programmatically through its REST APIs and Redfish APIs. And I'll, again, I'll demo that as well. We also have a workload optimizer, right? So we can get deep visibility into how your workloads are performing not just on-premise, but also in the cloud. And when we see that, hey, there's resource contention on an EC2 instance or a VM on-premise, we can actually kick in automation and take action to relieve that contention so that not only are we monitoring when there are performance issues, but we're actually taking action to relieve that performance issue before your customers know that there's a performance issue, right? And I can do the opposite, right? Because with this tool, I can manage and automate elasticity of my resources. So if I have a VM or EC2 instance that has more resources than it needs, well, I can take that resource automatically and give it to another asset that needs it. And what that does for me is prevent the need to have to buy more servers, right? Or more cloud resources. Because this allows me to use what I have more intelligently, more efficiently. And not only do our customers find that their workloads are running more effectively, right? They're finding that they're running at better performance at lower costs, right? And that's the whole idea of this tool. Because if you're using it effectively with the automation, it's going to pay for itself through cost avoidance. Because all of a sudden, when one VM doesn't need its resources, I can take it from it, give it to another VM, preventing me from having to buy more resources for that environment. All right. So seeing is believing. So let me uh, just jump right into the demo. And I'll try to slow it down a little bit because I know I've been talking kind of quick. Uh, but I do want to make sure I get through everything and give plenty of time for QA. So Intersight is deployable in a few different ways. I'm showing you a lab we have here at Cisco. This is all real equipment. We've got real hyperconverged. We have pure storage. We have Cisco UCS over many generations. And we have networking equipment all in here. Uh, it can be deployed as a SaaS tool, which is probably how 95% of Cisco customers consume Intersight, but it can also be deployed locally as a connected appliance or a virtual private appliance if um, you know, there's, there's a need to, to isolate the environment. So I'm going to walk you through the SaaS environment, um, but just know that however you want to deploy, we can meet that model uh, for whatever reasons, whether it's security or policies. Um, so I just went to Intersight.com. I logged in with my Cisco email, but you can set it up with your own single sign-on. 
You can also do DFA and you can actually restrict IP ranges that log into here. So if you want to force, um, you know, your, your peers to jump on a VPN to access this, you can do that. Um, so I got into this dashboard view. I logged in, right? This is based on role-based access. So this is my view, how I want to manage the data center. So I can see here, right, just from this high level view, like utilization information, I can find one-offs and outliers in the environment that help me manage it better and more effectively. Like for example, I got one server running 4.2 version of firmware. Maybe I want to go see why I've only got one running this and I can click this and it'll actually take me to that server and filter it for me. Um, but generally I'm not, not too concerned about uh, one server running a different version of firmware. This is a pretty big lab. Um, so. When I, when I jump to the dashboard view, I want to look for things that really are concerning. So one of the nice features of Intersight is it's actually going to let me know if I've got hardware compatibility issues. And it's actually letting me know I've got a bunch here that aren't. So I can click this and it's going to take me to all of my servers that have hardware uh, driver issues. So now I know I've got this list of servers that I got to go take action on, which before I might not have known unless I was having a purple screen of death to let me know that, hey, there's a driver incompatibility. So this is already helping me prevent an outage by letting me know what I didn't know before, right? So I can, uh, and I can remove this filter and I can see all of my servers. So this lab you're seeing here is geographically dispersed. So it's only in two different locations, but um, right again, they're geographically dispersed in Virginia and I'm up here in Massachusetts. So um, there's no real geographic limitation for me to use this in a, in a world where most uh, folks are working remote at least one or two days a week. A tool like this is super helpful in helping me manage my equipment wherever it is, wherever I am. All right, so here are all my servers in my fleet here. Again, across a couple different locations. Think, one thing you'll notice here is um, we do have some new servers and if I open one up here, I can kind of quickly show you what it looks like through uh, this nice little graphical display. Um, we have these vertical blades now as opposed to horizontal can take you know, six front facing drives plus two internal, um, lots more scalability in this platform than previous. Um, but you can notice here that I've got high level health information. So I do have some health issues that I wanna look at. I can see contract information, right? This is a, a lab system, so we don't really have any contracts here. Um, but I can also go look at that hardware compatibility. And I can see that based on, you know, hey, this is the model hardware it is. This is the firmware we're running. Well, based on all that, and the operating system, right, running 7.0 update 3, I can see that I actually have an incompatible driver on my RAID controller, right? So I can actually go get this driver. I can confirm the driver I need. Right, just by dragging this out. Um, and I can actually plan for the future as well. So I, I know I have a bad driver and I know I can go get the new, the replacement driver by clicking this link. But maybe I'm going from 7.0 update 3 to 8.0, right? Or maybe I wanna go back, right? I can go click here and find out what my future drivers will be so that when I go plan my VMware upgrades, well now I can go build a baseline in Lifecycle, in Lifecycle Manager to go match these drivers so that I don't find out after the fact and have a whole second project I'm signing myself up for to go update drivers after I've done my VMware upgrades. Right, so the idea is to build the guardrails so that you can focus on what's important to you. Right, which probably isn't the physical servers. So I know those drivers need to be updated. Um, so I can add that to my list of servers. But maybe I want a, a better understanding of the whole environment holistically. So I can go look up here and get a better under, understanding of aggregated alerts. Right, so I can see I've got all these issues across my, my environment. Um, and that's all fine, right? This is a lab, no one expects it to be 100% clean, but Vulnerabilities is something that IT will shut our access down for. So I can click this up here. This is my advisories. So this is letting me know, hey, you've got these security advisories in your environment. I was unaware, right? Most of Cisco customers don't even know unless they're reading release notes, which is the challenge because again, you have more important things to do than the read through Cisco release notes. Um, so the idea is to give you the information proactively at your fingertips so that you can plan accordingly. So I know I've got these uh, vulnerabilities in my environment and I know to take action. And I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to this in just one second. In addition to security advisories, field notices, end of life advisories, because again, a lot of folks don't know that like M4s go end of life in February, 2024, which is not as far as it sounds. So again, no one wants to be surprised in the data center with a vulnerability, bad drivers, 
end of life equipment or security vulnerabilities. Intersight gives us all that information at our fingertips so I can start my day understanding that and plan around that. But let me look at a server here. Let me just pull open something, something kind of interesting here. One thing you'll notice here, uh, and actually I should um, definitely point it out a little more, but there's a Dell server in here. There's an HP server in here. So this is much more than just Cisco stuff, right? This is meant to manage the data center, right? So if I go into system, just to kind of show you what the ecosystem here looks like, I can go into targets, claim a new target, so a lot of stuff in here that doesn't say Cisco, right? HP OneView, you know, obviously you see a servers, application performance monitoring tools, both Cisco and competitive, right? Um, programmability tools, Ansible, SSH, Terraform, databases we can integrate with, your cloud providers. We have AWS integrated into this lab that'll take you through. Uh, your hypervisors, we have VMware integrated as well. Um, we can support uh, hyperconverge, both us and Nutanix cloud native workloads, networking equipment, fiber channel equipment, and then storage. So again, this is much more than what UCS was in terms of data center management. And in fact, if you have a DevOps team, this is single stop shopping if you're trying to populate a knock because now I've got one REST API interface where I can pull information on my hypervisors, my applications, my storage, my servers, my networking. So I don't have to go and then, you know, I don't have to go data mine all these different platforms, all these different data center assets to go figure out the health of my environment, right? Intersight provides that single stop shopping, which is really nice. All right, so let me just jump back out into servers here. And let me just go show a quick example here of uh, a really old server. Because again, I can manage brand new servers, but this can also manage really old servers, right? At least from a complementary perspective. So I have a B200M3, this is very old, right? A few of you folks might have had them in the past, they're not even supported by Cisco anymore. But they're in here and we're actually collecting data on here. So if I actually go click this server, just pick one of the random ones, right? I can see this blade, I can see health information. Most importantly, right? I get the same hardware compatibility I got in the brand new server. Right, so, you know, obviously Intersight powers Inter uh, Cisco UCS X series, but it also really helps in managing a legacy environment as well. So I can see my drivers are compliant here in the same deal. I can actually go grab drivers if they weren't, and I can actually go upgrade this old server right from here as well, right? So I can do some actions from here. I can launch KVM. I can actually cross launch UCS manager if it's an older server, um, but let's just see what an upgrade would look like. You know, today, if you have UCS servers, it can be a little cumbersome, right? You, you, you go to Cisco's HCL website, you download the software, uh, you upload the software, and then you kick it off from a, um, a policy perspective. With Intersight, it's radically simplified, right? I just point and click on the device I want to upgrade, and it's actually going to make a recommendation. And I like this one. If I want to read the Cisco release notes, right, I can go click the release notes. And I can select next and then upgrade. And the cool thing about this is it's going to not only recommend the version of firmware for the server, but it's going to cisco.com, downloading the software to the Fabric Interconnects, making sure that there's enough space on the Fabric Interconnects and kicking off the upgrade. So it's going to actually leave this server in a pending state. And then from that pending state, I can actually jump into VMware kick off a VMware upgrade. And when it goes and reboots the host to do that VMware upgrade, it's gonna actually kick off and do the firmware upgrade to the server as well. So it's very, very easy to take uh, the built-in integration with something like VMware and take what would be two projects and make it one and one reboot and one outage. So we'll let that do its thing here. Um, so that's servers, and again, I can, I can you know, do multiple actions. I don't have to pick one server, right? I can click a bunch of servers and I can actually click and do firmware upgrades on them all. Um, so I can do a whole cluster in VMware and pre-stage those as well. So I don't have to do one at a time. Um, we also have networking equipment in here and I'll, I'll jump into that just a little more. But the point of this tool is I, I can see the whole ecosystem. We have our Hyperflex clusters, which is Cisco's Hyperconverged. I can see some utilization information. 
Um, if I just go grab one random one and get health information, I can actually create data stores from here. Um, but what's really cool is I can actually go do full lifecycle management from here as well. And not only can I do that full like life cycle management, it's going to orchestrate the cluster where it'll go and upgrade the software on the cluster and it's going to go upgrade the firmware on the cluster and it's going to do them in a fashion that is non disruptive one at a time, put a node into maintenance mode, vmotion the VMs, do an upgrade that that node, bring it back into the cluster and then go to the next one. And what's really cool is just like with the servers is I don't have to get the ice cream headache figuring out compatibility. Right? I just go into here, it's going to make a recommendation, and then it's going to make a recommendation based on these codes, and then it'll go orchestrate the whole thing. No human intervention required. All right. We also have storage in the lab. So we have really tight partnerships with Pure Storage, Hitachi, and NetApp. We happen to have Pure in the lab, so I'm just going to take you through it here. Um, we're running API calls to the pure array, right? We're not running any agents anywhere in this environment. So we're running API calls to all the ecosystem partners we connect to. So we're seeing its kind of perspective of the world. So I can see utilization information. I can see how many hosts are connected, right? This good summary view. I can see inventory, so some lower level information, but I'm not creating volumes here, but I can. And I'll show you where in just one second. Um, but just know that like, hey, if I'm a VMware administrator, and I don't see my host in its host group, well, then I probably got a problem and I need to talk to the storage person, right? So um, there is really good information in here, whether I want to go see the health of the system, drives that are populated, um, or how it's configured from like a host access perspective, I can do that. Um, but if I want to create data stores, I'm actually going to go into our cloud orchestrator. And our cloud orchestrator is our Inter is, is our automation and orchestration engine um, it's built right into Intersight. Again, not a one size fits all. So, if, you know, you're already using Ansible, you know, this isn't a requirement, um, but it is a really, really useful feature and it's very, very easy to use. You know, for example, um, everything that has a description comes with this and I can simply click and execute this right here to kick off this automation script. So most of the stuff came pre-canned. And you can see here, there's a lot of interesting things like create VMFS and NFS data store, right? Um, so I can automate down into the virtualized infrastructure. You know, for example, I have a really simple one I'll take you through. This is for creating a volume on a pure array, right? So we can do the same thing with NetApp and Hitachi as well. In fact, the NetApp integration is a little more tighter and I'll take you through that as well. Um, but I wanted to create a storage volume on our pure array in the lab, and I wanted to throw it in a host group so all our UCS servers could go see them and access them. And it was two tiles, super easy, right? So all I had to do was find the pure volume and drag it out here and then put in the inputs, right? The inputs are like, hey, what's the storage device? What's the name of the volume? How big should it be? What host group should it go into? So for most of those things, I don't want to answer that. I want the user to answer that. Um, with the exception of the array, right? I only have one storage array, so why am I going to go ask the end users to choose from a choice of one? So I'm going to define that, but then I'm going to ask the users to, to pick everything else. And that's really what all this mapping is here. But maybe I want to take this a step further and make this a VMFS data store, if I can spell it, right? So now I can drag and drop this in as a new VMFS data store, but there's a lot more features than just, again, creating simple volumes, right? If I search for virtualization, um, these are all the tasks I can do in a VMware Hyper-V cloud type environment, um, right? Things like new VM from template, right? Resize a VM, destroy a VM, right? I can create full self-service through this if I want, right? We have integration with tools like uh, ServiceNow, so it can be orchestrated upstream from Intersight. Um, but again, just to show how simple this is, if I delete this mapping, Right, I now deleted the mapping of my storage array. To remap it, right, I can either create a static value, which just says, hey, show me something that I've already discovered, which is what I'm going to do. Um, but I could also go do advanced mapping, which means, hey, ask the user and then populate this variable based on what the user has inputted. Again, one array, so I'm just going to choose one, the one I have, hit select, hit map, and by saving it, it's going to do an error check for me.
right? And that's it, right? And I can go see what the code it generated and I can export this for my records if I want to use it manually, if I want to do it, uh, edit it and use it elsewhere, right? So it, de it develops all the JSON code behind this. So I don't need to have a DevOps team to create DevOps like deliverables with, with Intersight. And what's really cool is, you know, I, I do have a lot of customers that are already doing some sort of self-service, right? And they're like, well, we're really happy with Ansible. We don't plan on changing that. And that's totally fine, right? Um, for those customers that do have a lot of um, you know, automation built in uh, and have operationalized it, right? We can certainly invoke, right? Ansible Playbook, PowerShell Script, Terraform, but you can also just use our APIs. You know, for example, you know, in Intersight, if you at any point click on the help, right in the right corner, go to Help Center, right? This is a great resource um, for understanding Intersight, but I can go into API documentation right here. And what's really cool is if you do have a DevOps team or if you have someone that's just trying to automate some, some of the back end office stuff, some of the minutia, right? They can go into API reference here. And what's really cool about this is now I can search for all the different API calls, right? Maybe I want to know SimC firmware. And what's really cool is if I look right here, right? This is the account that it's going to run that API call against, right? So if I do this and hit send, let me find one where I actually have permissions to do it. Uh, firmware summaries, that sounds good. So now I know which API calls I need to invoke when I'm automating my environment, right? Just by playing around in here, figuring out what the results are from what API calls and what firmware calls is going to give me the info I need. And I need to extrapolate as part of my knock. So very, very easy to work with. Um, you know, I, I, I was a UCS customer um, a long time ago before I came working at Cisco and we found the XML APIs of UCS very difficult to work with. Um, but Intersight takes that all away. And the one thing I do want to point out is, you know, you can, you, your UCS environments do not have to go away, right? So, you know, for example, if I jump back out into the infrastructure service here, that M3 I had, right? It's actually still going through the process here, upgrade firmware, right? Um, this, this server here is using UCSM and I'm just making my life easier. And I can actually cross launch into UCSM from here. Um, and, and again, it makes my life easier. I'm not on the VPN, but I can tunnel into our lab through 443 through Intersight. Now I can disable that and I can force people onto the VPN through some of the security mechanisms here. But as a remote employee, being as effective as possible, this is great, right? I can get into my equipment very easily, very quickly, um, and make whatever changes the organization needs of me. But keep in mind, UCSM is no longer necessary because now I can get my pools, my policies, my templates, and my profiles all through here, and UCSM can go away. But that's entirely up to you. This can be used complementary with UCSM if you want lifecycle management, ease of use, visibility, but you still want to use UCSM in the background, that doesn't have to go away. Um, but it can, if you want to simplify your environment, have one tool to manage everything, again, regardless of where you are, where the equipment is. And the beauty of it is it's not limited by a domain like in the past. So now my pools, my policies, my templates, and my profiles can be globally used by my servers wherever they are. And that is a big difference between UCS Manager and Intersight. Okay, now we're just doing a quick time check here. Just wanna make sure I don't go over time and we have plenty of time for QA. I'm just gonna take you into the last portion of Intersight and then we'll open it up for QA. So we talked about the infrastructure service, which allows us to do configuration automation, configuration enforcement, right? Kind of the bread and butter of Cisco servers. Also allows me to manage my storage, hyper-converged, um, fabric interconnects, and even my VMware environment, right? Um, and more than just VMware, this is all virtualization. So Hyper-V supported, but so isn't your cloud instances. So I, you know, I've got 131 VMs and I can filter on them and I can pull them up to get more information. You know, utilization information, I can do some actions from here, uh, launch VM console, which actually is pretty useful. Um, 
but I can also filter it on my EC2 instances. And again, other cloud services, we just happen to have an AWS account. So now I can go see my EC2 instances. And again, I've got one common pane of glass to go view configuration health of all of my data center assets, even if I'm gonna go into AWS's portal or vCenter after to do more lower level management, this still gives me the ability to start my day at a 50,000 foot view and get a good understanding of my environment or to enable DevOps folks to do their job more effectively without having to write to a bunch of different endpoints. All right, let's talk about our workload optimizer. So a workload optimizer is only supported on the SaaS version. So that's only the real caveat versus SaaS and locally deploying. Um, this is delivered as a SaaS tool. Uh, but our workload optimizer is designed to build out automatically, once you start discovering your data center assets, it builds out this uh, supply chain view to your virtualized resources, whether they're on-premise in VMware or Hyper-V, or they're in the cloud, right? So again, we only have three EC2 instances, so not super exciting. Um, but I can actually click on this and I can see right away, even just from the colors of the donut graph here, that I've got some problems, right? And I can see here underutilized net throughput. And if I go to actions, it's actually going to make some recommendations for me that should save me some money, right? If I make these changes, I'm going to drop from this an hour to this an hour. And the whole point of this tool is to look at your environment more holistically so that it can make the most effective and holistic changes without having to make counter changes because I've made change too much on VMware, which had an un, you know, unintended consequence, which then I now have to take more action on, right? All right, so let's take a quick look at our VMware environment. So I have this full supply chain view of my entire environment. I can see from an internet connection because again, I'm discovering my switches I'm discovering my fiber channel switches, I'm discovering my storage, my UCS servers, and my hypervisor, and my cloud instances all separate, right? So we have the ability to automate across all of that with this tool to help make sure that the environment is running as smoothly and as efficiently as possible so that you're not playing the whack-a-mole game every time you get an ITSM uh, ticket that says, hey, I've got poor performance on this VM. Because at the end of the day, your, your internal customers aren't going to complain when they're over-provisioned with resources. They're only going to complain when they don't have enough, right? I, I used to work in a cloud environment, and when we used to go and, and take, you know, self-service requests for 12 vCPU and 64 gigs of memory, we'd give it out. And then we'd run tools uh, like VMware tools to go understand, hey, are you actually using these? But the problem is the possessions line tends to the law. So in that environment, we actually switched to this tool. And instead of giving our, our customers exactly what they asked for, we started minimally configuring what they asked for. We give them two vCPU and two gigs of memory. And then when this tool saw that there was contention or were trending towards contention, it automatically hot adds those resources in. So the end user was actually never aware that they didn't have those resources the entire time. Um, and, and what that did for them is it gave them the resources they needed to do their job, but it kept our internal costs and in our cloud environment lower. So that we actually used to buy six servers a quarter to keep up with our cloud demand. We went a year and a half without having to buy any servers. So that's 36 servers of cost avoidance we did with this tool just by more effectively managing it. Because what this tool is doing for me, right? It's got automation where it can go into the VMs, right? And see, hey, you've got vCPU congestion or you're over-provisioned on memory, which, you know, this is a lab system, so it's pretty common. Um, so the idea here is, well, if I know that if I go from this to this, my utilization will go from this to this, which is still pretty acceptable, then I'm going to get a gig of memory back to the pool that now other resources can leverage. Again, avoiding the need for me to go buy more. So not only am I saving money, but I'm increasing performance because, you know, there's obviously these resources that I just showed you that are, are sitting there a little contention or a little... Um, over provision, but I do have other resources in here that, that do have contention. So I don't have to go buy more CPU resources to go deal with this. I can just go take CPU resources from a VM that doesn't need it, right? And that's the beauty of this tool. And with the automation here, and if I'm happy with that, right, I can click the button and hit apply, and it'll actually go hot add those resources in. But I want to set this up so it's automated. So I don't even have to go click that button because at the end of the day, I don't want my end user to know there's a problem. I want that problem to be resolved before they have a chance to open an ITSM ticket and have me do it, right? And that's where the beauty of this tool comes in because if I can automate when uh, I can take resources away and when to add resources in, well, that's a lot of minutia you don't have to do that you can spend your time more strategically planning, right? 
But it's also more than just, hey, let me move around your resources in your VM environment or in your cloud environment. I can do a lot of what if scenarios, which are really cool. So maybe the organization is saying, hey, we have to move this application to the cloud. Well, all right, I can go model what that would look like, right? So maybe I wanna go grab this VM. This is our AWS account. If I had an Azure account, it would show up here as well. We just don't happen to have one. So I'm gonna throw it into our account and I'm gonna throw it in North Virginia. I'm gonna run the plan. It's gonna give me two things. It's gonna tell me, hey, the cost as is uh, on a monthly perspective and all the steps I need to move it. Um, and then it's also gonna give me the optimized cost, right? So you can see here is a huge difference. So I, ch I chose a good one randomly here, so I got lucky. Sometimes I choose the opposite and doesn't really uh, illustrate what I'm trying to say, but right, this VM is way over provisioned. And if I move it to the cloud, is this gonna cost me $130 a month. But based on its utilization, how we're using it, I could right size this as an EC2 instance for $8 a month. So there's obviously a huge gap here. And not only can I do that, but I can automate the configuration of EC2 instances, just like in a VMware environment, so that my OPEX costs drop drastically when using this with the cloud as well. So now I have the cost of moving this workload to the cloud, uh, both as is and optimized. So I can run that plan against another plan that says, all right, maybe I wanna refresh the hardware and see what that cost is. I can build a template that says, hey, my standard host is 768 gigs of memory and two 12 core CPUs, whatever it is. And based on that template, this is gonna tell me, hey, this workload you have right here, this is how many of these servers you need to effectively run it. So now I've got my quote and my, my, my forecastable economical costs of migrating to the cloud versus the hardware costs of refreshing the hardware it's on. So now I can go to the business and say, look, these are your choices. This is gonna cost this much and this is gonna cost this much, as opposed to moving the workload and then finding out from a billing perspective, well, it, it costs too much. Um, so there's a lot more to this tool. Uh, I know we're kind of coming up on time here. So let me just jump back into the presentation and make sure there's enough time uh, for some Q&A here. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, Intersight's not a one size fits all, right? There's gonna be some parts of it that make sense for some organizations and some parts of it that make sense for other organizations. I've got customers that are using our workload optimizer and none of the infrastructure services and I've got customers doing the opposite. Um, but if you're a DevOps person, if you work with the networking, if you work with cloud, if you are working with you know, on-premise infrastructure like VMware, Intersight can make your life a lot, lot, lot easier. Intersight's also the easiest thing at Cisco to try, right? It's a SaaS tool, go to intersight.com, you can sign up, you can try any of the things I've shown you uh, for three months, um, you know, risk-free, right? W whether you've got UCS servers today or not, right? So that's something, uh, you know, you know the, the folks at Aqueduct can help you with, something that people at Cisco can help you with, um, but it is the easiest thing at Cisco to demo and try out in your environment and we're, we're happy to assist. And just like I was saying, all right, it's again, not a one size fits all. I got some customers that prefer to use SaaS, some customers that prefer to deploy locally. Um, so we can, we can deploy this and right size it for your environment. Uh, and it can even be consumed as a phone app, not that I recommend it. Um, not that it's bad, but for your mental health, laying in bed, Doing IT work is probably not the best thing for your life or marriage or whatever. Um, and again, I've got lots of customers who consume this through upstream tools like their ITSM tool. Um, think of our automation engine. It's a lot um, cleaner, smoother for your end users to kick off that automation upstream through a tool like ServiceNow. So sorry for going a little quick at the end here. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't cut everyone off and that um, you know there was some time for, for question and answers. So. Happy to take any um, questions, comments, or concerns. Let me just make sure I'm not missing Rich, anything. There was, one that, there was one that came up on an earlier slide from Dominic. What about staged updates? Yes. Yeah, let me... Um, so if the question is like, um, hey, I want to schedule this for two in the morning, 
That was a feature in UCSM that I haven't seen yet. I, I did have another customer ask me for that just recently. So I did reach out to engineering. So if, I, I can certainly um, work with Aqueduct to get an updated answer on that. But in terms of staged updates, what I would do, I don't think I have any that are staging. Yeah, so this is staged right here. So this server is staged and ready to go. If I click proceed, it's gonna reboot it and start the upgrade. This is what I was mentioning earlier. At this point, if this was a production environment, I would leave it in this pre-stage state and I would jump into VMware and I would go kick off my VMware upgrades. And when it goes and reboots this host to do a VMware upgrade, it's gonna kick off the firmware upgrade too. So I could leave, you know, if I had a cluster of six servers, I can leave all six servers in this pre-stage state and then go and, and do my rolling upgrade in, in Lifecycle Manager in VMware. And when it's done doing one server at a time, I'll upgrade to my VMware environment and my firmware and my UCS. So that's what I would recommend. Um, but if you are looking for like the, hey, I wanna start this at two in the morning while I'm asleep, um, that, that's something I'll have to follow up with you on once I get an answer from engineering. Hopefully I answered the question. Thank you. A uh, couple more that came through. The first one is how does Intersight work with Nexus Cloud? That's a great question. So Nexus Cloud, and I'm not a, I'm not a Nexus expert just to, to throw that out there, but Nexus Cloud will be another service in here. So you'll be able to click Nexus Cloud. It'll take you to another screen, just kind of like workload optimizer. And it'll show you, you know, Nexus Cloud where you can go get, you know, information that we're streaming out to, to our SaaS offering. But it, it will be um, as another service in Intersight. I just don't have it here at the moment. Any other All questions? Right, last one. I'm, one more I'm seeing, um, and again, if you have any, please feel free to send them over. So um, you showed a lot of interactions with other platforms. Can Intersight work with containers? Yes, so we do have, um, we do have a Kubernetes engine. Uh, it's going through some changes just because uh, we've got a partnership with IBM and Red Hat that will probably make some announcements in the near future. But yes, uh, we do have support for cloud native workloads. Um, if I just jump back into system here, you go to targets, cloud native. Yeah. So we do have some support for it, but I would say keep tuned in that space, because uh, we are going to have probably some announcements relatively soon with, with Red Hat. That's all I'm seeing at the moment, Rich. Thank you. Let me just switch back. And you said that was all the questions? That's all we're seeing. Um, so thank you, Rich. Um, nothing like seeing the tools live, so, um, and your passion certainly comes through. So appreciate you spending the time with us and really diving into that demo to show our customers how they can leverage this tool. So thank you very much um, yeah, for being with us this morning. Yeah. Um, I just so had one everyone... more. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. I just had one more come in, sorry to interrupt. Um, no I did problem. have one more question come through. Um, someone's asking, is there a free version? Yes. So there is a base version. Um, keep in mind, it's designed for M6s and older, starting with M7s. Uh, there won't be. But if you have an M4, M5, M6 in your environment, it's not going away right away. That free version will stay around as long as you have those generations of servers. Starting with the M7s, it's, it's going to be the essentials and above. The free version will give you uh, features called uh, connected TAC and alert, uh, aggregated alerting. Connected TAC is really, really useful. Um, if you have your servers using the free version and you open a, a Cisco TAC case, the TAC engineer can pull your logs without your involvement. So it just re reduces the amount of like resolution re logistics you have to go through with a TAC case. So I, I would very much recommend going to intersight.com, signing up for the free version and onboarding your servers. And you can talk to us at Cisco or Aqueduct and we can help you out with that. Great, thank you. Um, so as a next step, we will be sending the recording and the slides from today. If at any point you'd like to schedule time with our team, we do offer advisory sessions and complimentary workshops across all our practice areas. Um, those are run by our engineering team. And of course we pull in folks like Rich 
as well to join the conversation. So just reach out to your account manager for more information on those. Um, if anyone is planning to attend Cisco Engage on Thursday down at Gillette, we will be down there as a sponsor. So please stop by and visit our booth. We'll have some fun swag to give away. And we are hosting a happy hour over at Bar Louie at four o'clock. So you're welcome to join us there as well. We'll put that registration link in our follow-up email. Um, and again, if any questions come up, please don't hesitate to email those over to myself or your account manager. We'll make sure we get those answered for you. Um, and also any feedback on this session or if there's other topics you wanna make sure we're covering, we are building out our virtual calendar uh, throughout the rest of this year. So we'd love to hear what topics you're interested in learning more about. So thanks everyone again for joining us this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you soon. Thank you.